Hello everybody and welcome back to our physics engine programming. So today we're going to implement friction into our physics engine. This is going to be a, a big step for realism in our physics engine. As you can see, everything right now just kind of slides along. There is no friction. Um, the circles don't rotate because there is no friction. And nothing really stops. It's like everything's on really slippery ice and it just can't stop. So today let's go ahead and add that friction to our physics engine. So I'm going to add some friction constants to every one of our flat bodies. And for our engine, I'm going to make these values between 0 and 1, uh, indicating that 0 is kind of the minimum friction, meaning there is no friction at all, and then 1 meaning that we have the maximum amount of friction possible. Now in real life, I'm not sure, I, I don't believe that um, friction constants exist between 0 and 1, or, or, or not that they're necessarily clamped between 0 and 1. Uh, but I'm going to do that for our, our engine to kind of simplify things just a little bit as far as friction is concerned. Uh, but if you're writing a physics engine and you want to investigate more about how friction works, um, in fact, uh, one of the ways you can implement friction is actually defining uh, friction tables. So you have actual uh, a friction table that takes two materials into account, and then it'll actually give you a friction constant for those two values. Uh, but for our engine, for this engine, we're going to make it just a little bit more simple. Uh, every object is going to have a friction constant. That's going to be between 0 and 1. Then we'll use those values to actually calculate the friction impulse. Okay, so here we are inside of our flat body objects. Let's scroll up to the top. We're going to add a couple fields here. So when we implement friction, we're going to have two different types of friction. And let me go ahead and write those here. So the first one... These are both going to be read-only values as well because they're not going to change. They're going to be constant for the life of the body. Uh, the first one's going to be the static friction. Okay, and the next one we're going to call dynamic friction. Um, I don't pretend to know all of the exact details of how that works, but there's a friction that exists when you're just starting to push an object or get it moving. So you have an object at rest and we're just getting it moving. That's the static friction experiences. And then you have a dynamic friction, which is the friction you experience while an object is currently moving across another object. So now we have a static friction and dynamic friction constant. I'm going to go ahead and go to our constructor and we're going to specify these values and they're going to be constant for all of the bodies. So the static friction should be higher than the dynamic friction. So I'm going to start this out at 0.6. And then dynamic friction, I'm going to make uh, 0.3. So it's going to be half as much as the static friction. Or maybe I'll make it 0.4. Let's, uh, let's do 0.4. And these are values we can play with as we uh, actually implement this and see what feels better for us. When you're actually implementing a physics engine, you may want to specify static and dynamic friction inside the constructor or, the, uh, or inside the function that creates the body. For us, we're going to simplify this just a little bit. We're just going to make them constant for all the bodies, and then we can uh, change that later if we need to make it uh, something that you want to specify for each individual body, depending on the material. And if you're implementing a physics engine, maybe you actually specify materials. Um, so you could say that this object is glass, or this object is iron, and then actually give it a friction value, a, a static friction value and a dynamic friction value based on that type of object. Uh, but for now, let's just make these constant at 0.6 and 0.4, and we'll test those values and see how it goes. And this will just simplify it as we're implementing this and just make it the same for every object. Okay, so now we have the static and dynamic friction values. Let's go back to our flat world. Uh, we're going to scroll over here, and uh, here's our resolve collision with rotation function. Um, now we're going to actually make another function here. I'm going to call this resolve collision with rotation and friction. Uh, so I'm going to copy this function, our previous function. Okay, and then right after we paste that in there, I'm going to rename this. I'm going to call this resolve collision with rotation and friction. Okay, so this is basically going to be the final, the final collision resolution function that's going to have all of the impulses. And friction um, is actually going to be another impulse that we need to calculate, but it's going to be an impulse that we calculate in the perpendicular direction to the normal. Okay, and we can see what that looks like here in a second. Here's what we left off with. We're actually uh, looping through all of the contact points. Uh, we're calculating the impulse that we need to resolve the collision with rotation 
and with linear velocity. And then we are looping through and applying those impulses to the rotation and to the linear velocity. So the next thing we're gonna do, I'm actually gonna copy these, uh, these two loops, uh, the loop where we calculate the impulses and then the loop where we actually apply the impulses. And we're gonna do these again. So let me copy this and we're gonna paste it right below. Okay, and we're doing these loops again, but instead of applying them along the normal, we're gonna apply them along the tangent or the perpendicular to the normal. Let me go ahead and draw what that looks like here. All right, so what we have here are two objects at the time of collision. And uh, let's just pretend that this box here is static and this circle here is dynamic and it is, um, it is hitting this box with a relative velocity that looks like this, that's our VR. Now, once we resolve the collision, we're gonna get a vector that looks something like this. Let me redraw, redraw this after collision is resolved. All right, so here's our new velocity after the collision is resolved, okay? Now, this is not exact. I'm just kind of giving an example here. So once we've resolved this using impulses, we have a new velocity of the, of the ball object or the circle object. And now we wanna calculate the friction. And friction is going to be perpendicular to this normal value. And it's going to be perpendicular pointing either this direction or this direction. And it totally depends on what velocity we get at the end of our last calculation. So once we calculate the impulse for the normal resolution, now we're going to calculate the impulse for the tangent resolution or the friction resolution. So I'm actually going to use either tangent or perpendicular vector kind of in interchangeably. But the uh, perpendicular vector or the tangent vector is what we're going to use to actually calculate the friction or the friction impulse. So we need to get the perpendicular of this normal value relative to our uh, velocity, our new velocity, after the collision is resolved. So, and if we do that, we're going to get a vector that points out something like this. But friction actually happens in the opposite direction of this value, of this tangent. And so what we want to do is actually get the opposite tangent vector, which points something like this, and that'll be our friction direction. Okay, and then we, after we get that friction direction, we can then calculate uh, the amount of friction or the impulse of that friction in that direction. So let's go back to the code and let's see what this looks like. So the first thing we're doing is here's the top of our function. We are resolving the normal friction, or we're getting our J value and resolving that. And right here, we're applying those impulses. And now we're going to calculate an impulse for friction. Uh, so the first part, this relative velocity is not going to change. Now, we don't need this contact velocity magnitude anymore, so I'm going to get rid of that. But I'm going to use this relative velocity to now calculate this tangent velocity here. And let me write the code for that just to see what that looks like. So we calculate that tangent or perpendicular uh, velocity. We calculate that tangent or perpendicular vector. And I'm just going to call this the tangent. We take the relative velocity and we subtract the dot product of that relative velocity with the normal of the collision. And then we multiply it by the normal of the collision. And that will give us the tangent vector that we're looking for. And let's draw what this looks like. So I'm going to draw the dot product of the relative velocity and the normal. Here's the normal vector. Here's the velocity vector. That's the relative velocity vector. We're going to project that onto this normal value over here using the dot product. Um, that's going to give us a scalar value over here. And then I want to we want to actually project that onto the normal value. So we have to multiply the normal times that dot product scalar. And when we do that, we're gonna end up with a vector that looks like this. And let's redraw it down here. So then we end up with a vector that looks like this, the relative velocity projected onto the normal value. So then we're gonna take the relative velocity and we're gonna subtract that whole calculation we just did by projecting the relative velocity onto the normal. And let's draw what that looks like. So if I take the relative velocity, which looks like this, and I subtract this vector over here, which we just calculated, that's the dot product of the relative velocity on the normal, that means I'm gonna add a negative version of this vector here, okay? Which means I'm going to add a negative version of this, which will be the opposite direction. 
which would look something like this. When I add those two together, I'm going to get another vector that looks like that. Okay, so our final uh, vector is going to look like that. And if I draw that all by itself, it's going to be that. Now, if I put that up here, let me erase all of this. That vector is going to look almost exactly like that. So that's going to give us our tangent vector, which is the perpendicular of the normal, uh, pointing in the direction of this relative velocity here. Okay, so now that we have that tangent vector, we're going to go ahead and normalize that tangent vector. But I only want to normalize the tangent vector if it's actually greater than zero. So if the tangent vector is actually zero, we're going to skip all of the rest of the calculations. So let's do a test here. I'm going to use our flat math library that we created. And we have a function called uh, nearly equal to, that checks to see if a floating point value is close enough to zero that we're going to consider it zero. zero. So we're going to take this, um, this tangent vector and we're going to see if it is close to zero. If it is close to zero, we're just going to continue with our for loop. Okay, we're not going to do any more calculations. We're just going to consider it zero. All right, so if it's not zero, let's go ahead and normalize this vector. All right, so there we go. So that's the, um, that's the main part of the calculation right there. We get this tangent value. For the rest of our calculations, um, we're simply going to substitute this tangent value for all of our normal values here. So for our previous loop where we were calculating the normal impulse, now we're going to calculate the tangent impulse. So every time we have normal here, I'm going to put the tangent. And instead of perpendicular dot n, this is going to be the perpendicular dot t. Uh, same thing for our denominator calculation here. We're going to have the perpendicular dot t. So all of these calculations are exactly the same, and, but instead of using the normal, we are using the tangent. Okay, now this is going to be our, our j impulse value. Instead of calling this j, I'm going to call this jt. So this would be the j tangent, or this is going to be the impulse for the tangent resolution. Uh, now we have this contact velocity magnitude. I actually need to calculate that again. So I'm going to go up to where we calculate that in the previous loop. Let's copy what that was. And that's the dot product of the relative velocity with the normal. So let's copy that. Let's bring it back down here. And instead of using the normal, we're going to use our tangent value. Okay, so again, we're just doing everything. We're doing all of our operations on the tangent instead of the normal, okay, to figure out our uh, friction resolution. Now, one more thing. We don't need this 1 plus e value, which is our restitution or bounciness value because we're not going to have any kind of restitution or bounciness that's applied to the tangent. But we are going to leave the negative value there because we want this resolution to apply in the opposite direction of the uh, velocity. Okay, So if the velocity is pointing that way, the tangent or friction resolution is going to apply this direction. And if it applies this direction, it's going to give the circle a, uh, a rotation that goes this way. All right, so back in the code, uh, that looks good. So we're calculating the relative velocity with the tangent to get our JT value. We're dividing by the denominator, and then we're dividing by the number of contact points we have. So now right here we have the actual impulse calculation. Now our impulse calculation is going to look, uh, so the impulse calculation for the, uh, for the tangent is going to look just like the impulse calculation for the normal, except... We're going to change these, so it's going to be the uh, tangent magnitude, our jt. And instead of multiplying by the normal, we're going to multiply this by the tangent. And so that is the completed impulse calculation, but I'm going to call this the impulse uh, friction calculation. Okay, so let's just change that uh, naming value there. So we know that this is, this is the friction impulse that we're calculating here. Um, in fact, I'm going to change that around. Let's, uh, let's actually call this friction impulse. Now we have our friction impulse. So now instead of actually applying the friction impulse here, we're going to save the friction impulse just like we did before. And so in order to do that, we need another array that's going to contain the friction impulse. So at the top of our uh, world class, 
here we have our impulse list. Let's make another one, uh, another impulse list, but this is going to be the this is going to be the friction impulse list. So I'm just going to call this friction impulse list. Okay, let's go ahead and create that inside of our constructor. Okay, now down inside of our actual resolution code here, let's see. So here's uh, resolve collision with friction. We need to clear those values as well. So at the very top, we're clearing all of our lists. Let's clear the friction impulse list as well. So at every item, we're gonna reset those to zero. And actually we're just resetting the values all to zero every time. And then down here at the very end, um, let's go ahead and save our friction impulse. So right here, so every friction impulse list at i is going to be equal to the friction impulse. So now after we do this loop, we're saving the friction, um, the impulse due to friction. Now we need to actually apply it just like we did before. We're going to loop through every contact point and we're going to apply the friction impulse. And uh, actually none of that should change. Um, everything should look exactly the same here except instead of grabbing the, the normal impulse, we're going to grab the friction impulse. So I'm just gonna rename this to friction impulse, and then we need to get the values from the friction impulse list. Okay, and let's rename all of these to friction impulse. Okay, and that should be pretty much it. Uh, so now the last thing we need to worry about is something called uh, Coulomb's Law. And uh, so Coulomb's law is something that basically clamps the, the friction impulse, okay? It gives it a maximum. Uh, I kind of drew out what that looks like here. Uh, Coulomb's law basically states uh, this formula here. So the force of friction has to be less than or equal to the normal force times some friction uh, constant. And this friction constant is our static friction. And so what this does is it basically clamps the friction impulse to be below a certain value. And if we write this up in our code, it's going to look like this. So we're saying the magnitude of the tangent impulse has to be less than or equal to the magnitude of our normal impulse times the static friction. And so let's go ahead and write up what that looks like. So inside of our code, um, we are calculating the friction impulse right here. We're going to do an if statement, and um, so the law states that the force of friction has to be less than or equal to the force of the normal times some static friction constant. Okay, so I'm going to use the absolute value because JT could be negative. So the absolute value or the force of our uh, tangent magnitude has to be less than or equal to our J value um, which is the, the normal impulse magnitude we calculated earlier, um, which we don't actually have access to right here. So we're going to have to get that and, or save that value. But we'll get that here in just a minute. That's going to be our J magnitude times some static friction constant. Okay, and we don't have that one either. So I'm just going to call that SF, which is our static friction. So let's go ahead and get this J value and let's get this static friction value. So the first thing I'm going to worry about is getting our static friction and our dynamic friction. So I'm just going to scroll up here to the very top of our uh, function for resolving the, um, the collision. And right after we calculate our E value, let's go ahead and get our static and dynamic friction values. So static friction we could get from body A, and that's just our static friction. The uh, dynamic friction, I'll call that DF, we can get from body A as well. But what I'm actually going to do is just to make this simple, instead of having a lookup table to look up what friction looks like between these two bodies, I'm just going to average the, the two frictions. So I'm going to take the friction from body A and the friction from body B. I'm going to add those together. And then I'm going to multiply it by 0.5 or divide by 2. Uh, just to get the average of those two frictions. Now, this isn't going to be completely realistic, but it should be realistic enough for, uh, for a video game or for what we're creating here. Okay, so now we have the dynamic friction and the static friction. Let's scroll down here to our uh, Coulomb's Law calculation. So now we've determined that the 
magnitude of the friction impulse has to be less than or equal to the J value times the static friction. If it is, we can just do this calculation. So we can just say that the friction impulse is equal to JT times the tangent. And let's actually declare the friction impulse up here. I didn't spell that right, so let's put uh, friction impulse. Okay, so now if uh, if Coulomb's law states that if JT is uh, greater than the impulse of the normal calculation times the uh, static friction con constant, we're going to calculate the friction using this J impulse magnitude. All right, so what that looks like, we have the friction impulse. That's going to be equal to now our J value, which we don't have yet. We'll have to get that here in just a moment, times the tangent times the dynamic friction. In this case, we need to actually reverse the sign of the J value because we want it to happen in the opposite direction. So just like we're reversing the sign on this JT value up here, we need to reverse the sign on the J value if we do happen to use that because it needs to happen in the opposite direction that we are resolving the normal value. Now, the last thing we need is actually this J value. And so we need to go up here and save that. And so I'm gonna make one more array and we're gonna call this the J list, and we're just gonna save all of our J values. Okay, let's initialize that list with two possibilities. Okay, and then down inside of our uh, collision resolution, here's our function. Let's go ahead and reset those values as well. So the J list at every index is gonna be equal to zero. Now inside of our impulse calculation, here's our first loop. I'm gonna save those J values. So right here, let's go ahead and save those to the J list. Okay, so the J list at every index is gonna be equal to that J calculation we're making right there. Oh, and actually this is not a vector. This is a scalar value. So I need to change that up here. Okay, so this is actually a floating point value, our J list reset all of these values. Okay, so these are these are magnitude values. This is the magnitude of the impulse, so I don't need to make that a flat vector. Okay, down here, let's reset that. This will just be, uh, this is the point where we set all your values, and we're just going to set that to zero. Okay, and then we're going to save the J to the J list. And now, inside of our uh, tangent or our friction impulse resolution, we can actually get the j value. So down here, let's go ahead and get our j value from the j list. And that'll look something like that. So right here, let's go ahead and go through this real quick. So here's our, here's our tangent or friction impulse calculation. Uh, we loop through every contact point. We're calculating the relative velocity. We calculate the tangent to the normal of that relative velocity. So that'll give us the direction that we're going to apply the friction, which is always perpendicular to the normal of the impulse. If the tangent is zero, we can just continue. We don't need to do any more calculations because we're not going to apply any kind of friction. If it's not zero, we are going to apply friction. And so we're going to normalize the tangent value. We're going to do our calculations for our tangent J value, just like we did for the normal calculation. Um, and then we're going to apply Coulomb's law and make sure that the magnitude of the friction is actually clamped to a certain uh, amount. And then we're going to save the impulse the, due to friction. And then we're going to apply the impulse, just like we did before. Just like we calculated the impulse needed to resolve the collision along the normal. And now we're doing the same, almost the same exact calculation except we're now we're applying the impulse in the direction of the perpendicular to the normal, which will give us friction in our simulation. Okay, so that should be it. Uh, finally, the last thing is we have this function that we just created and it's called uh, resolve collision with rotation and friction. We need to now add that to the, uh, the narrow phase here. So here's our resolve collision with rotation. This is now gonna be resolve collision with rotation and friction. And let's run that and see if everything works. All right, so here we are. I'm gonna add some bodies here. And so far that looks good. Let's go ahead and 
Okay, good. And you can see it didn't, the object, when it slid off of there, when the box slid off the other box, it didn't keep sliding. It actually hit and stopped because of friction. Good, and that looks really good. And you can see these bodies here aren't sliding off either because there is friction holding them in place. And you can see they kind of wobble a little bit, but um, they're not sliding off of each other because there is friction. Now, let's see, if we add circles, we should see the circle start to spin. And you can see it's rotating there because of friction. And that looks really good. Uh, let's add a few more circles up here just to see them rotating and friction being applied. And we can stack up some boxes here and the circles should collide with them. Okay, so there we are. So that is how you apply or add friction impulses to your physics engine. And you can see it's starting to look much more realistic. As I stack things up, they tend to kind of uh, rotate. Friction is kind of holding them together as they rotate and fall over. Uh, we can add some boxes up here and then some circles on top of them. And so now, because we have friction in our physics engine, it looks much more realistic. So that is how you add friction to your physics engine.